This reader interview is sponsored by the patrons of the Rereading Wolf podcast. All right, now we have David Stockoff. David was an active user on the Earth list, and he had some of the the most interesting inputs and theories. I always <laughs> made an effort to read David's posts. However, this is interesting. David doesn't really listen to the podcast, which is not a requirement, but he does participate on the Facebook group, which is interesting, and I like that. How you doing, David? I'm good. How are you? All right. Are you ready to do the questions? I certainly am. All right. First encounter with a wolf story. Uh, my first serious, conscious, knowing encounter with a wolf story probably was the, uh, the thag stories in the Continuum series. There were four different anthologies the, I think I, made up of multiple short stories with four different short stories by the same author in each volume. Right. I think at least in one instance, the four different short stories were written by different people. Ah, okay. Interesting. So I was, I was a, a subscriber to fantasy and science fiction in the late seventies, I guess maybe for like five years. So I know I encountered him there, but the, uh, and the thag stories were about the same time, but it was the thag stories. And I can't remember any of their titles, but I'm sure you know what I mean. Yeah. Edited by Roger Elwood. And, uh, they all came out around 75 to 78. So I, I accidentally somehow picked up the first one. I don't know how I was, uh, you know, 15 years old. I don't think I was a, you know, huge science fiction bookshopper yet. I don't know. Maybe I was. Anyway, I don't know how I got it. I know it was accidental. And of all the stories, the wolf one was the one where I said, wow, this guy knows what he's doing. What is he doing? <laughs> what happened? I need to know. So I made a mental note to wait for the second continuum book. And of course, Nowadays, you would just put a watch on, uh, you know, you'd, you'd put it on your Amazon <laughs> list or something. But um, right. this required yeah. actually <laughs> going to the bookstore and looking every six or 12 months. I don't, I don't know. Keep, keeping an eye out for it over for the next couple of years. And, uh, and hope the store didn't stop carrying it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And hopefully they actually carried through with all four right. issues. Uh, so yeah, it was, uh, it, it was nail biting. <laughs> but, um, so I, I had to know. And of course with each story, the mystery deepened and, you know, 40 years later or whatever, I, I still don't know exactly what happened, but you know, it was, it was clear that a thag was, uh, it was, it was, as, as I think of it, it was a collision of mythologies with now I realize it is classic wolf. Uh, what if, gods or demons or whatever were, um, uh, if, if people tried to understand them as Freudians, uh, you know, in our modern psychology framework, what would we do with uh, demonic possession and things like that? And of course, you know, possession is something that Wolf has repeated dozens of times. And, um, you know, Thag, I, I think, is some kind of ancient evil almost on the Cthulhu level, who uh, will never go away and always there, always will be there lurking. That's that's what I recall of it. I'll have to look at Mark's write-ups <laughs> to see if I remembered it correctly. But um, yeah, lots of stuff going on in those stories. Uh, this isn't one of the questions, but you kind of alluded to something that I'm always searching out and asking people about. What is the secret sauce in Wolf's stories that he did what he did and he got away with doing right. what he did, which is kind of like asking what makes him so good? Mm. Because he came up along with a lot of really good writers. And, you know, as I mentioned to someone recently, there's no Wolf school in literature. Yeah. He doesn't have imitators. Bob Dylan has imitators. Wolf doesn't have anyone trying to imitate what he does. Right. Not exactly. Yes, he's... He's easy to imitate in some ways, and in fact, uh, some people have done some some brief parodies that are 
that are dead on. So there, there are certainly ticks. <laughs> but yeah, you clearly here was here was an author who stylistically knew he understood his voices, right? And his voices illuminated his characters instantly and perfectly. And yet the events never entirely added up. And you knew broadly what happened, but. In detail, I mean, how would you explain this story to someone? You know, it's it's like the challenge of summarize this novel in six words. You can do it; it's painful, but it doesn't necessarily do justice to the story. And even a short, you know, a short story you'd think ought to be even easier. You know, a character meets fate; something happens. That's that's what a short story is about. Something happens, but for Wolf, it ha- it's it's a it's a very specific event that occurs in a specific way and is understood by characters in a certain way, which may or may not be reliable. So anyway, yeah, very hard to reduce. So that was something I picked up on. Right. All right. Next question. Favorite novel or short story, either or both? Uh, I hate to be boring, but it has to be New Sun. New Sun completely blew my mind and probably actually, in some ways, rewired my brain. (laughs) I have not been the same person since I read that first book. Wow. And I couldn't tell you exactly how, but when you, I mean, it it comes from rereading over and over again for a period of years and just thinking about a story basically all the time and uh, trying to understand the narrator. What would Severian do? This is similar to something that happened to Severian, or Severian said something about that. What did he mean? Let me look that up. Yeah, it had a major impact on my thinking. Favorite wolf word? Um, I could not tell you. Too many. I haven't been keeping up. <laughs> I, I have unfavorites, but that's a different question. <laughs> again, too many. So yeah, again, obviously New Sun. I love the words. Many of them I was familiar with from paleozoology. Many of them I was familiar with because I was interested in Roman era cults, which were largely Greek or Persian in inspiration. So I was familiar with religions and so on, Zoroastrianism. So 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 many of those words that are, I guess, technical religious terms like pantocrator are awesome. All the Greek words are amazing. They they are wonderful to look at and to pronounce and, you know, drop them into conversation. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, that's a good idea. You could go to church and refer to God as a pantocrator. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> there is no pantocrator. Yeah. And so, yeah, speaking of church, it's funny because um, I always tell people, my parents forced me to go to church, and mostly what I did was I sat and read Revelations. Every Sunday, I would pick up Revelation and read it and reread it. Ah, good training for reading a wolf story, though. Exactly. Yeah, that probably messed me up, too. But anyway, so yeah, any word with arc in it, I... I mean, the political terms, the... I mean, Greek is just great for technical terminology of all kinds. Yeah. It's so precise. But I think the word I chose, I think, is a little bit of an underdog word because it was something... It was a word that I already knew, and I loved encountering it and knowing what it was, and that is Amshaspan. (laughs) That's a good one. And the Amshaspans were the immortals of Zoroastrianism. And so... Definitely one of those WTF moments where you're like, okay, what religion is Severian? I thought you were basically a Byzantine, you know, icon work. Something like that, something reasonably similar to it, but emanations from uh, Ahura Mazda, emanations of Ahura Mazda. Ahura Mazda. Um, they... Well, I mean, they're related. I mean, they're certainly, they would be familiar to anyone who is familiar with Gnosticism. And so, of course, that obviously has been a huge topic for for 40 years. And, uh, you know, Plato, the Platonist, worked with emanations and so on. And, of course, that's where they got the idea from. But anyway, that's just one word. Personal non-consensus theory about a wolf story or any? Um. You know, there were so many. It, it was fun back on the Earth list because n- none of us knew what we were talking about. <laughs> so all sorts of ideas were thrown around. Some of them were dumb in retrospect. Well, many of them were. <laughs> uh, <laughs> many were brilliant. Many of them were Ouch, clearly. Ouch, that hurt. <laughs> I'm not talking about you. Um, 
No, I I remember actually you you had a you had worked up a, a, an interpretation of Long Sun according to specific Greek mythologies, and I I was always disappointed that I never heard more about that. <laughs> well, I still have them. <laughs> oh, maybe one day. The thing is that once you get deep into these stories and you try to detail them, the question is, how do I lay all this information out? You feel like you have to write a whole book right on top of Wolf's books. But, right. you know, maybe one day Craig and I will get to Long Sun and we'll probably spend an hour and a half talking about half a chapter. Easy. Easily done. Yeah. <laughs> Every two weeks. Right. So some of those ideas I have forgotten. And of course, Mark Mark Aramini has really illuminated so much for me of uh, of Wolf's process and his his structure that um, really you know now I think we have at least a um, a matrix in which we can put things and pull specific things out and analyze them and ask why are they here what do they mean in the matrix uh, where before we were just pulling individual threads and you keep pulling them and you keep pulling them and you can't stop pulling them because they keep coming. Yeah, but they continue to deliver. Yeah, yeah. But I think one that has come up recently that I was reminded of and I think is is actually a non-Mark Aramini theory, and that is the reverse Earth that came up in some Facebook discussion recently, so I was reminded of it. And that is the idea that Wolf told us over and over that his earth u-r-t-h is not our earth e-a-r-t-h it is it is not in any easy way our past or our future it is not really it's not a parallel it is similar but nothing is necessarily the same there are correspondences but they are not necessarily direct correspondences and so yes we can look at the rough approximation of South America, but then some things simply don't make sense. But many of those are explained, many of those little problems where Severian is facing uh, when he's walking along the shore is is probably the, the one place that holds all that information, really. But if, if you reverse everything, then it makes sense. The sun rises over the Andes and sets over uh, Nessus which, of course, is Buenos Aires. So anyway, uh, and, you know, I, I have seen the maps, and that is the one solution that seems to elude people, but it seems to really make everything finally perfectly fit. And it's hard to get your head around. And, of course, part of the problem with it is why would anyone do that? But if you understand what Wolf is trying to do with Severian, then it does, you know, in, in the biggest picture, then it does really make sense as to why he would want to tell us, this is not Earth. Stop thinking this is Earth. It's completely, it's, it's a wrong Earth. Uh, it's not an alternate Earth. I mean, obviously, life developed and humans evolved and so on. But beyond that, <laughs> not a whole lot is, is really similar. And then, of course, that corresponds. That's a clear flag that we should not look at Earth's moral development or religious development in, with assumptions that it's going to be the same. And he emphasizes that, of course, by clearly suggesting to us that these people are like the Greeks in some way. They use Greek terminology, or at least the translator does. But then what are all these Persian ideas doing then? He sets it up and then he knocks it down. And what he's telling us, of course, is that it, it, the translator tells us specifically, he chose words that seem to fit the idea. And he did this without any respect to their origin. And of course, I don't remember there being too many Chinese words, so it's <laughs> clearly there, there's a classical envelope to the whole thing. But other than that, mm -hmm. the indications are really clear that uh, you, you can't make any assumptions about mm -hmm. what people on this planet believe, and specifically, of course, about God or anything God-related. So, Right. All right. Most frustrating mystery in a wolf story. The big frustration for me for 30 years has been the, the long sun. <laughs> the, the components of that frustration are, of course, what's green. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think that has been resolved. Yeah, yeah. I think Mark was right. Yeah. Yeah. But then 
The bigger question is, what is blue? Exactly. <laughs> right. Right. And that is where, I mean, it's it's still awkward. But again, you can see that Wolf has no scruples in a <laughs> sense. He follows rules, but he's he's not going to follow conventional thought. Yeah, he's uh, not going to show you his calculations, right? <laughs> right. Right. But if, but if something is physically possible, you may encounter it. And, uh, and it all has to fit, of course, into the overall moral and symbolic framework. And I think Mark has shown that that, that answers all those questions, at least at a high level. Uh, so you, uh, you say it's long sun. I think it's interesting that you say long sun and not uh, short sun. Uh, so uh, what mystery is it in long sun? Is it just what are these two planets? Right. Well, because why did the ship, why did it return? Mm -hmm. That annoys me because I mean, for all, all sorts of reasons. But then obviously could easily happen. Why? Did, did the ship go out and find no life anywhere in the universe? No habitable planets? Well, we know there are habitable planets. Yeah. So why would that happen? It's not a dead universe. It's a universe full of monsters. <laughs> you know, the, your usual explanations don't quite seem to fit. Oh. And well, you know, you do bring up a good point because, you know, when Typhon sends out the world, the, the galaxy is populated. He knows that. He's probably from another planet, right? That's, that's It's not out to explore <laughs> unknown territory. A right. generation ship is kind of a weird thing. Right. But yep. if the whole point was for it to travel not to another place, but another time. Right. Yeah, I like it. I like that. That's another explanation for why Mark's blue-green theory makes sense. I hadn't thought of that. Very good. If Typhon knew in some way what the future held, for example, if you just look at the, the new sun, oh, well, there's going to be a flood right. and life is going to be wiped out. Well, of course, you're going to get together a, yeah. a generation ship, move people off for off planet for a couple thousand years and then have the the shipboard computer bring them back and then they populate earth probably not what was really thought or, or what happened but we don't know we don't know his thinking as wolf said he might have had any number of reasons yeah for doing what he yeah. did but the you know the whole idea of the world being an ark and typhon or silk being noah or something like that you know they didn't sail to someplace else yeah, the ark just returned to where it was before, after the flood. Yeah, clearly they didn't even try, because if they had been heading heading somewhere else, it would have been it would have been it would have taken them a lot longer to even visit one planet and right. find out that it's uninhabitable and then come back. Right. And what a waste of energy <laughs> that would be. Before you, you you send a generation ship, you have to know that there is a planet that is habitable and not occupied. And you have to know right. that it's going to stay yeah. unoccupied for the 500 to 1,000 years that it's going to take to get your people there, because otherwise it's going to fail completely. <laughs> and you only have one. So I think the fact that presumably, I mean, there could have been others, but presumably we have only one that is an indication of the you know the unitary nature. It's it's return. It's not going out. Yeah, I mean this is a solar cycle story. So naturally, you're going to come back to where you began. Right. Excellent. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. This was again entirely sponsored by the patrons of the Rereading Wolf podcast. You can go to Patreon.com/slash Rereading Wolf to play a part in bringing other amazing things like this into the world. And if you want to take on the five questions with us, reach out to us by email or one of the other methods listed in the show notes of this episode. We need to bring you closer to me, so don't you squirm now.